Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to be sharing information today that I've never talked about before. In fact, I, I spent some time this morning adding new slides to this PowerPoint from various sources because the, the field of genetic engineering is evolving very quickly. But unfortunately, our ethics and morals and, and long-term vision and understanding of the DNA and consequences is not evolving at the same time. Before we start, I want to get a, a sense of you and what your habits are. So I'm going to ask you to rate yourself in terms of from 0% to 100%. What percentage of your diet is organic? And I'm going to make it hard and say that includes going out to eat, going to movies, eating at other people's houses, everything, going on vacation. Give yourself one number right now from 0 to 100, and I'm going to ask you to Raise your hand if you're in the following categories. How many people are 0 to 20%? Raise your hand. Okay, I'm looking around. I see several people. 20 to 40% organic. Raise your hand. About the same amount. 40 to 60%. About the same amount. 60 to 80%. Similar. 80 to 100%. And a little bit less. Okay, this is pretest. We're going to see what your numbers are going to be like in the future. And now I want to ask you, I'd like you to rate GMOs in comparison to climate change in terms of a planetary threat. Three questions, are GMOs less dangerous, about the same, or more? Okay, how many people say less dangerous, raise your hand. About the same, raise your hand. More dangerous, raise your hand. Well, more dangerous clearly has it maybe five, uh, <clears throat> five to one. Um, and that's, I found that interesting. I asked that question for the first time in September, and I wasn't expecting it. But this is the eighth audience I've asked. And in all eight audiences, it was equal to or greater was, was the GMOs versus climate change. Now I'm going to tell you why I think that's the case. And I'm going to do it by showing you, I'm going to start this lecture by leaving the stage and show you instead a three-minute video, which is at the, at the website protectnaturenow.com. And after watching it, you get, it gives a sense of one of the new areas that we're focusing on that's absolutely critical, an existential threat like no other. So you're going to enjoy watching this three-minute minute video, and I'll come back on If we stop climate change, save our oceans, and protect our soils, we may still lose the natural world we cherish. A quiet invasion is underway, where companies who profit from altering DNA are declaring open season on all parts of nature. Like the gold rush of the Wild West, there is a global gene rush underway, moving from engineering crops to engineering entire ecosystems. From algae to animals, fungus to flowers, bacteria to bees. With genetic engineering techniques such as gene editing costing less than ever, nothing is off limits. Once released, GMOs reproduce. Artificial changes can spread through the environment and corrupt the gene pool. We have no strategies to clean it up. The only thing lasting longer than a permanently altered gene pool is extinction. Last century, the assault of synthetic chemicals polluted nature. Today's genetic assault could replace nature forever. What is the most common outcome of genetic engineering? Surprise side effects. It's not that individuals seek to permanently replace nature with unpredictable laboratory creations. It's thousands upon thousands of labs racing to get their invented organisms out there first. And many governments, including the US, Australia, Argentina, Brazil, and Japan, are eliminating regulations and safety precautions, hoping that GMO companies can make quick profits and dominate. On June 6th, 
the Trump administration proposed new rules that would make almost every GMO exempt from regulations by the Department of Agriculture. On June 11th, President Trump signed an executive order to further erode government oversight. In addition, it authorizes the U.S. State Department, trade representatives, and other agencies to work together to convince the world to accept GMOs and, by October 9th, have a strategy in place to use the maximum financial, political, and diplomatic pressure to arm-twist the nations of the world into fully accepting America's GMOs. Do you think the citizens of the world will have something to say about that? We do. In fact, we invite you to join a global protest to say it loud and clear. It's time to blow the whistle. Not just for our children and grandchildren, but for all living beings and all future generations. They're depending on us. Protect nature now. Well, there you have it. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs> now, I'm not going to leave you with no hope and no plan. That's not my job. For years, for a quarter of a century, I've been focusing on another aspect of GMOs, the health dangers. And the strategy was to redirect people's purchasing power so that it would influence the food industry so that the food industry would kick GMOs out, even if the long stream of presidents from Reagan on were pro-GMO. And it's worked. 46% of Americans are seeking non-GMO food, and food companies are kicking them out. But at this time, because of the inexpensive nature and still highly risky nature of gene editing, we're in an entirely new world. You can go on Amazon and buy a do-it-yourself gene editing kit for $159 before Christmas and $161 after, so you missed out on saving $2 to create new organisms that have never been part of the history of evolution. And if you happen to flush them down the toilet, you've just done an environmental release. Now, when we show this three-minute film, some people are wondering, well, how bad can it be? What could possibly go wrong? So a large portion of this lecture is that, answering that question. And I'm going to give you some good news and some inspiration at the end, so don't leave in the middle. You'll be very depressed. <laughs> so I want to start with fish. There are almost 40 fish in the pipeline, maybe many more by now. And already there's genetically engineered salmon being sold and consumed in Canada, particularly in restaurants and by catering organizations. And when they did research on this fish, they found that the allergic responses, according to the reaction in the blood, was 20 to 52% higher, but they considered it not statistically significant because they only used six fish. In other words, they designed the study so that even a huge increase in allergenicity could be avoided, knowing that they were about to be feeding it to millions of people. This was in criminal in my mind. They also found that there was higher levels of IGF-1. In, in one case, 40% higher. That is a cancer promoter. And they used a, a method of detecting growth hormones that was so bad, they couldn't detect the hormones. And rather than improve their detection, they said, there's no problem. They didn't find a difference between the experiment and the control because they didn't find it anywhere. This is not science. This is corporate science. This is tobacco science. Now, what, are, what is the genetically engineered salmon? Well, it's designed to produce a growth hormone nonstop. And so it grows fast. A similar salmon was studied in Canada by scientists and they put these genetically engineered fast-growing salmon in tanks 
either just with the GMOs or with the non-GMO salmon. And when they fed them enough food, it was fine. When they lowered the amount of food, the frankenfish freaked. Why? Because they're fast-growing and they're voracious. They're always hungry. So they became cannibals and started killing and eating their competition, whether they were genetically engineered or not. And it, in each tank, there was either a population crash or a complete extinction. They also would travel to different parts of this fake underground ecosystem, hunting out other fish, whereas the natural salmon wouldn't go there. So they became highly aggressive, cannibalistic. And if you imagine what could happen uh, in the oceans, it's tragic. But here's another scenario of a Japanese type fish called a madaka. They genetically engineered it, and there's a mating advantage because it's a little larger, the females go after the larger males, and their offspring only have a 70% survival rate instead of 100%. So in Purdue University, they put 60 fish in a computer model of a population of 60,000, programmed the natural behaviors of the GMOs, and found that in 40 generations, there were no more fish. These, for whatever reason, these particular characteristics, higher mating advantage, lower survival, resulted in extinction. Now, these are the, we know that in North Atlantic alone, more than two million salmon escape the fish farms. Now, the genetically engineered salmon are not supposed to be grown in fish farms. They're supposed to be grown in inland tanks. However, there's now interest from all over the world, and we know that the monitoring and guarding the movement of GMOs has been poorly, poorly supervised, and they've had things stolen out of uh, test plots and things diverted and sold accidentally. So imagine what would happen in the world in the oceans, if we have these genetically engineered salmon, either you have these adolescent gangs of ravenous fish attacking species or wiping out the salmon uh, population, or we don't know. So this is an example of something that could be catastrophic to the ecosystem based on a single pair of fish released outdoors if it comes to it. There were mosquitoes introduced into four countries. These mosquitoes were engineered to create sterile offspring, sterile male offspring. So when the male breeded with the female, they would create offspring that wouldn't survive. And they were supposed to release only the males, and it was supposed to drive down the population of the particular mosquito that carried dengue and Zika. And it was released in Brazil, by the, million, by the billions, in Cayman Islands, in Panama, I believe in Malaysia, and it was, it, it, they intended to release it in the Florida Keys and in Texas. Now, I was in the Florida Keys testifying at the Mosquito Control Board, and I mentioned to the Oxitec scientist that when you genetically engineer, you change the structure and the, the safety profile, and they, had they ever tested to see if the saliva of the mosquito, which was certainly gonna bite some humans, was dangerous. And he said, well, we're in the middle of an experiment right now to see if the protein that's expressed by the inserted gene is expressed in the saliva. And my thinking is, it's a little late, guy. You've already released millions or hundreds of millions of mosquitoes, and they don't just release the males like they promised, they release millions of females that bite, and it could already have been doing problems. So I said to him, you know, when you genetically engineer, there's a lot of massive collateral damage that occurs. When you took a human gene and they put a gene in there, another uh, human cell, they put a gene in there, 
up to 5% of the functioning genes change their levels of expression, which could increase the allergens or toxins or carcinogens in the, in the saliva of the mosquito. Shouldn't you be testing the entire saliva for changes and not just the existence of a particular protein? And his response was brilliant. He said, good idea. And then I argued with him, saying, you know, what you're doing is criminal. I didn't use that term. Because you're releasing mosquitoes and you can change the gene pool of the mosquitoes forever. And he said, oh, that won't happen because these are self-limiting. They will die off. He knew that about 3%, according to his research, survive. But in the presence of tetracycline, it can be up to 18%. And we also know that it's a leaky technology and it doesn't always work. And I was explaining to him that he was completely naive and he was explaining to me that I was completely wrong and I was right, unfortunately. In Brazil, they tested the population of mosquitoes up to three years after the release. And they found between 10 and 60% of the samples contained genes from these genetically engineered mosquitoes. Which means that the mosquito gene pool is forever changed. One of the aspects of GMOs is that it becomes a permanent change in the gene pool, as you saw on the film. You can't recall the fish from the ocean or the mosquitoes from the air, and we have a changed gene pool for mosquitoes now. And we don't know if those mosquitoes are less likely to be controlled by insecticides, or if they're more likely to carry Zika or Dengue or some other disease. So here was the scientist arguing with me, the same scientist that only after millions were released decided to finally look for one change in the saliva, ignoring all the others and ignoring what nature does best, and that is to pass her bounty and survive. In the 90s, there was a genetically engineered bacteria engineered to turn plant matter into alcohol. And some very well-meaning scientists had a great idea. Let's send this bacteria to farmers. When farmers finish their harvest, they often burn the crop rubble. And instead, they can mix it in huge barrels with the bacteria and turn it into alcohol. Turn a spigot on the, on the barrel, get the alcohol, and run their tractor. Then all of the nutrient-rich sludge at the bottom of the barrel could be spread on the field as fertilizer. The EPA said, great, go ahead, do it. You've already done, you've tried to test it this way and this way and this way. We have no further tests, go for it. A graduate student, needed some research for his PhD. Talked to his advisor, Dr. Elaine Ingham. They approved research on this particular bacteria, Klebsiella planticola. And he did something that was not required. He tested that sludge as a fertilizer. So he put soil that was growing wheat seeds over here, soil that was growing wheat seeds with regular Klebsiella planticola, and then the GMO version. The, he mixed the sludge with the, with the soil and grew the wheat seeds over there. Two weeks before they were going to release this bacteria to see how far it spread on its own. That was their first experiment. Let's put it outdoors, release it, and monitor how far it goes. Two weeks before that, Saturday morning, shows up at his laboratory, gets into his workplace, and he's, oh my God, I must have done something wrong. All of the little sprouts of wheat on the GMO side were just this green slime. It was all turned to mush. He figured he did something wrong. But when he looked closer, he realized that the GMO bacteria had turned the plants to alcohol. Elaine Ingham, his supervisor, told me, 
later on, someone from the EPA told her about a secret study that the EPA will not acknowledge. They released a different GMO bacteria to see how far it would spread. In the first season, 11 miles. And after they stopped funding it, one person continued to test it in wider and wider regions, sometimes on her own dime. And eventually they found it everywhere on Earth. So when you put that study from the EPA together with this, I asked Dr. Ingham, what would happen if they did release it, if it was deployed? She said, it could end terrestrial plant life. All the crops grown in soil have this bacteria. If you introduce a GMO bacteria that outpopulates and outsurvives its natural parent, then it could be replaced by bacteria that would convert all the plant roots to alcohol. So it could have been a cataclysm. So you had headlines like, a biological apocalypse averted. This was in the 90s, but it wasn't the first time we had a biological apocalypse convert, uh, averted. In the late 80s, scientists wanted to protect the value of strawberries in a field in when there was a frost. They knew that there was bacteria on that on that bacteria on the uh, crop that turned the water into frost at higher temperatures than would otherwise be created. So they genetically engineered the Pseudomonas syringae to not have the magical powers that it did to allow water to freeze at higher temperatures. And they were going to spread it out throughout the industry. But it turns out that Arguments made that there were weeds that could also be that are also killed because of frost would become super weeds and so they they incinerated where they had done the test plots and they never released it. But now we know that this magical bacterium is responsible, it's airborne, it's all over the planet, it's all over the atmosphere. It's responsible for creating water vapor droplets for clouds. It's it builds Snow, frost, it's used in snowmaking machines. So what would have happened if this genetically engineered variety outsurvived the natural variety? It may have changed the weather patterns throughout the planet. Now these are just two types of bacteria. What do we know about bacteria? A lot more than we knew 10 years ago. The biggest thing in medicine right now, one of them is the gut microbiome. You take a fecal transplant, fecal matter from a sick animal, put it in a healthy animal, the, animal can, the healthy animal can get sick. You take healthy animal's feces, put it into a sick animal, and the sick animal can get better. Fat to skinny, skinny to fat. Humans, similar changes. Dr. David Perlmutter told me about an autistic boy. They did a fecal transplant. Two weeks later, he was speaking in full sentences. There's some kind of crosstalk programming that happens in the bacterial world. I talked to Dietrich Klinghart, a doctor. He said, the microbiome of the brain, they've tested it. It's what gives us intelligence. If you reduce it, you get dumber. The bacteria changes in the breast of a woman with a breast cancer. Why? Because it's there to help. There's new organisms in the brain for Alzheimer's. There to help. They're like the mini Jedi army inside of us and around us. We genetically engineer bacteria. What happens if it ends up in our gut, in our bodies? What happens if it swaps genes as bacteria does? And now we have genes that don't do what they're supposed to do because they, we have now a gene that was created in a laboratory. Or the soil, we know almost nothing about soil microbiome. We know just a tiny portion. And yet we're playing with it with bacteria that has very little testing and unpredicted side effects. 
And this year, this genetically engineered bacteria is being sold as a fertilizer for the first time. And soon, these pre-probiotics, genetically engineered, will be sold as well. There's gene editing is being talked about by the biotech industry in the same way that genetically engineered soybeans and corn were talked about 25 years ago. Safe and predictable. Don't need regulation. Well, so many studies have proven that false. But what well, didn't stop Australia from saying, you can gene edit animals, plants, bacteria, microorganisms of any type, and release them into the environment, or sell them to people to eat, and you don't have to tell the government. They just call it breeding, which you can do on your own, and you can do whatever you want. So there was a study that was published about cows that were gene edited to knock out the gene that created horns. So they created hornless cattle. So they could stuff a lot of cows in together in factory farms. And when they published the research, a letter from a very pro-GMO mouthpiece <laughs> um, wrote, a letter wrote saying, this proves we don't need any regulation on gene-edited animals because it's perfect, no side effects. This proves that it's precise and predictable. And sure enough, they started to grow these hornless cattle in Brazil. They were filling out a herd for release. Well, in the fall of this year, in September, the FDA decided to actually do a sequence of part of this cow's genome. And they found that there were pieces of the bacteria that was used in the genetic engineering process that were stuffed into the gene edit. And now every cell of these cows' bodies had antibiotic resistant genes that could resist three different types of antibiotics. Now, if the gene from these cells were to transfer to pathogenic bacteria, either in the cow's gut or from the cow manure or from the decomposing cow or from eating the cow in our bodies, it could promote diseases that would not be treatable with antibiotics. There's someone speaking at this conference where in the conference program it says there could be as much as 700,000 deaths per year due to antibiotic resistance. I don't know if it's that high, but it's certainly in the tens of thousands in the United States, and there's also a lot of amputations to cut off the part of the body that has the untreatable infection. When this was made public, they killed all of the genetically engineered cows in Brazil that they were growing out to create herds, and we averted a near catastrophe. This was their poster child. Now, how did it happen? When you do gene editing, you create enzymes, let's call them scissors, and they cut the double-stranded DNA, but not at random they have another guide that's attached to them. And the guide looks for a certain sequence. When they hit the sequence that they want, it cuts it there. Now there's some problems. Sometimes that sequence appears over and over and over in the genome. So it'll cut there and there and there. Those are called off-target cuts. Sometimes it'll cut things in similar sequences. And for some reason, sometimes there's a thousand point mutations at the end of this exercise, or uh, it's insertions or deletions. Now, the people using gene editing tend to use an algorithm, a computer program, to let them know whether it's safe. They predict the most likely other cuts. And then, in our infinite wisdom, we say, would cutting the genome over there cause any problems based on what we currently know about the way the DNA functions. 
So with that little bit of knowledge of what we currently know about how DNA functions, which the scientists say, well, this is all we need, they say, yeah, we can afford to do gene editing for a crop and introduce it into the food supply, even though we know there'll be some off-target cuts. But there's also on-target problems. And among the many of them, even if it cuts it exactly where it's supposed to, when the cellular mechanism, the repair mechanism, reconnects the DNA, things can happen outside of any control of a scientist. And one thing that it appears to do is to grab DNA from around itself to patch the hole. And so it grabbed the bacterial plasmid, the circular piece of DNA, that was used as part of the genetic engineering process and stuffed it into the cow genome. Now, that created antibiotic-resistant genes in cows. In mice, they brought in DNA from cows and goats because the serum in the Petri dish was from cows or goats, and they stuffed in cow and goat DNA into the mice including retroviruses. HIV is a retrovirus, a virus that integrates into the DNA. So here is a way we could end up creating new diseases from different animals. We're talking now about a virus in China that came from an animal. Here we're talking about transferring potential viruses from one animal to another through gene editing, and they're not even checking, in general, the genomes after they do this. They just assume it worked. In fact, one form of gene editing is to knock out particular genes, and everyone who does it assumes that it works, and they go on with their experiment. Hundreds of thousands of genes have been knocked out by gene editing before experiments are done or products launched. This study came out two weeks ago. It found that they tested 136 sequences where they knocked out genes, and in one-third of them, the knocked out genes were still producing proteins. And in some cases, the proteins that they produced were truncated because part of the information was deleted, leaving only a portion of the DNA RNA to create the protein. So we're creating proteins that have never before existed in nature that could be allergens or toxins or carcinogens, which means that of the hundreds of thousands of knocked out genomes, genes throughout the world, maybe one third of them did not function because they don't follow up to see what actually happened. They just go with what was predicted. And there's genetically engineered mushrooms that use this knockout system from CRISPR that are ready to introduce into the U.S. food supply. They may already have been introduced. I don't know. I don't think so. But we don't need to know because they sent a letter to the USDA saying, do you need to regulate us? The USDA said, no. We don't regulate this kind of CRISPR stuff. The FDA doesn't require any testing or notification. The EPA doesn't require any testing or notification unless it produces a pesticide. So there's no regulatory agency in the US that needs to look at these mushrooms. So they could introduce it at any time, and we don't know if the knocked out gene is creating something that can knock us out. Now, there are already gene-edited products being sold. There's this oil that's being sold to restaurants, Cebus, and it's canola oil where they used genetic engineering to change it, and they're labeling it as non-GMO. Because they're claiming that GMOs are only when you transfer genes between species, but they only edited the gene within the species. So it's not what we consider, their definition is not what we consider 
correct. It's not what the European Union considers correct. It doesn't, it's not what the official documents in the United States correct. But they're going to say, we're just going to call it non-GMO. So it's already on the market. Gene drives. How many people have heard of gene drives? Raise your hand. Gene drives. Only just about three of you. Normally, when, you, when a mother and father produce offspring, the genes get div divvied up so that half of your offspring get one trait and the other half get another trait, and then when the offspring marry and reproduce and produce kids, then the game, there's another dilution. It happens quicker with fruit flies. With gene drives, you genetically engineer so that your gene ends up on both sides of your chromosomes. It ends up so that when you give birth, all of the offspring have the trait, but you also, <clears throat> they also have the genetic engineering mechanism in their genes, which does the same kind of genetic engineering in them so that when they give birth, then all of their offspring have the trait and then all of their offspring have the trait. So instead of breaking it up like it is on the, on the slide here, you can see that all of the offspring at the bottom have the, the inheritance of what you've created. I was at a conference in the uh, UN Conference on Biodiversity, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and there was a group that was trying to push gene drives to wipe out rats from certain islands because they, had, they were invasive species. So let's create the gene drives and kill all of the rats. Maybe they'll produce just sterile males or maybe just males. Now, how did the rats get there? In the hulls of ships. If those rats that were getting the gene drive were ending up in hulls of ships, then it could end up on other places and other islands and other continents and we could wipe out a species. What happens to the ecosystem? Or what happens to the ecosystem if the gene drive mechanism transfers to another rodent, or to another mammal, or to a different species altogether, a different kingdom? Or what happens if your genetic engineering changes and it doesn't do what you're, it's supposed to do, like the mosquitoes, didn't kill it all, but makes the animals somehow more aggressive? or more dangerous. We're playing with nature in a way that is intentionally vast in time and space, and in a way that has a level of arrogance that surpasses what we could have even thought of before. This is a picture of a farm that has all the different plans that are currently being considered for gene drives from mosquitoes to corn to trees, all these different things. Are, there's groups that are considering how we can permanently alter nature and all the future species to better fit within our industrial agricultural model. This is the thinking. There's even people that have trying to have considered genetically engineering out the mothering instinct from cows and livestock so that when you separate their children, they don't get upset. So instead of structuring agriculture or to fit nature, they're trying to redesign nature to fit industrial agriculture. There's another type of insect. This is under development, not yet created as far as we know but it's being created by the Department of Defense, which we all have great confidence in, is <laughs> looking out for us. And these are insects that deliver viruses that will genetically engineer in the field. So you create the insect, it'll end up genetically engineering things that it interacts with. So that should be safe, right? Easily contained? <clears throat> now there's also digital DNA. We have the code. Let's build from scratch. Let's create what we need. <clears throat> There's a revolution in the speed 
of reading what the code is, the DNA code for different species. As of 2015, there were 2,500 high throughput instruments located in 1,000 sequencing centers in 55 countries. And the total would be, I'll read this, 35 petabases of genome sequencing, which is 1,000 million base pairs. 10 years later, 2025, they're expecting a zettabase, which is 1,000 million trillion. So instead of filling up a silo, it, if, one, if one grain of sand was one base pair, it would fill up 154 stadiums. We're talking about the possibility, and they say by then they'll have sequenced all of the 1.2 described species of plants and animals and have at least 2.5 million plant and animal genome sequences. Once you have the genome sequences, you can then engage in building or changing in a laboratory, mathematically, on a computer, and then have it done for you to see what the results are. Here's where biointelligence, AI, artificial intelligence, meets biotech. There are factories without humans. Robots, powered by artificial intelligence, to create genome sequences that are pushed in by people on the internet who want to get their genes created and sent to them. So you can have this whole apparatus working for you, ordering genes, having them sent to your laboratory or your garage, creating new things. <clears throat> and that's going to get cheaper and cheaper and you're going to have the availability of getting these genome sequences from these different organisms. So if you don't like something about an organism, maybe you want to try making a change and see what, if, see what it does. Now, unfortunately, we are babes in the woods when it comes to manipulating DNA. Most genes operate as families and networks. And it's very complicated. So that's why you don't see genetically engineered crops that actually increase yield or effectively grow better in drought conditions or salt conditions because that involves many, many different genes interacting together and they got lucky with Roundup Ready because they could, they could do that with one gene or producing the Bt toxin insecticide, they can do that with that with one gene. But even then it's producing a protein that the system may splice and dice and create many different versions of. We don't know, no one's checked. But we do know that we're creating a system where we can play with these elements of nature without understanding the consequences. I was, I told this yesterday that Monsanto did a big private investigation analysis of my life to try and find skeletons in my closet and discovered that I was a dancer. So now they call me, you know, dance teacher releases film critiquing GMOs, you know, that's the, because 20 years ago I taught dance, so uh, to, in order to pay to write the book that, that brought down Monsanto, or was helping to bring down Monsanto. So I was at a swing dance workshop in St. Louis, and I was with some friends. I lived in Iowa at the time, and some other people from the workshop came in during the lunch break, and we invited them to sit down with us, and a gentleman sat down across from me. And I said, what do you do? He says, I'm a molecular biologist. I said, where do you work? He says, Monsanto. I says, what do you do? He says, I test for safety of GMOs. <clears throat> he was a fellow swing dancer. It was lunchtime. I figured I'd go easy with him. And we just had light chat about allergenic constructs, you know, as you do over Thai food. And then I said to him, we know that when you genetically engineer, you insert a gene and you disrupt the DNA right at the point of insertion. You also disrupt it in hundreds or thousands of other locations by the time you create the plant, but I was just talking about something called insertion mutation, which is well understood and acknowledged. And I said, how do you know? This was like in 1980. No, no, not in 80, in um, 
This was like in 2000. And I said, how do you know that the gene that you're disrupting isn't important and could cause problems? And his response reminded me later of what the guy from the mosquito conversation said. He said, we're learning more and more all the time about which genes are important. Now, he had already released all these different foods where they may have learned afterwards that certain genes are important that have been changed. But I didn't get into that. I just hit him with the harder question. I said, what happens if all the genes are important? What happens if there are aspects about the sequence of the genome that we don't understand yet? What if it's using aspects of physics, like quantum effects, quantum fields, or quantum, quantum mechanics, that we don't even know how to test for? Silence. A very long and awkward silence. His friend that had sat down with us said, that's deep. <laughs> but the guy didn't say anything. After a long, deep silence, he looked up and said, but you know we need genetic engineering. I said, what? He said, we need genetic engineering. I said, why? To feed the world, because by the year 2040, and he started going off into the myth that GMOs are going to design to feed the world. And I knew he was sincere. And I knew he was wrong. And Research that has come out since 2000 shows that GMOs don't increase average yield, whereas agroecology agro can double yields in developing countries. Uh, a 12 million farm research study found a 79% average increase in yields not using GMOs. The UN experts for the ISTAD conference said GMOs have nothing to offer feeding the hungry world, but he didn't know. And that was his excuse for playing with the genome in a way that could cause damage that he can't yet figure out. And that reminded me of another scientist who did work for Monsanto, and I had a long conversation with him also about allergenic constructs, and I said to him at one point, you know, you know for sure that you cannot guarantee that a particular GMO is not going to create an allergic reaction in at least some aspect of the population because you can't test allergens beforehand because people don't even get allergic reactions until multiple exposures. And he said, but you know, we need genetic engineering. I said, what? He said, we need genetic engineering to feed the world for developing countries. I've been to India. I know how bad their agriculture is. We need to help India. So again, at the moment that I asked them about the science, about the fact that they were willing to expose the population for something that was almost certainly highly risky and more likely really dangerous, could have a negative effect, they jumped into the feeding the world argument. And I've also been to India, and if I talk to him now, I would point out what Monsanto's cotton seeds have done in India. They were not very reliable. They lied, I believe, about the effectiveness, and many people believe that their research and their proposals, preposterous proposals of increased yield were complete myths. And they went in with the most aggressive strategy, kicking out the non-GMO alternatives, and resulting in a genetically engineered cotton seed that very often failed to even give enough money to the farmer who had been convinced by the Monsanto advertising to borrow money from the loan sharks at up to 7% interest per month, and they couldn't even pay back the loans from the ridiculous results of this genetically engineered bacteria, uh, genetically engineered cotton. And faced with the possibility of losing their land and the shame of that, many committed suicide. I'm going to give you a number of the estimated number of GM cotton farmers that have committed suicide from in Monsanto introducing its genetically engineered seeds. 
250,000. So this is what this person was arguing for. He's been to India. He knows it needs Monsanto to come in and save them. And was willing to risk the health of people because India needed him. And now we're talking about turning this whole practice into something that Companies all over the world, individuals all over the world, governments all over the world will have access to. And one way that, one way that we can really disrupt ecosystems and cultures is with biosynthetic ingredients. Years ago, in 1980s, they wanted to save money creating L-tryptophan in Japan. Isn't this an uplifting lecture so far? We'll get to the good stuff. We'll get to the good stuff. They wanted to create L-tryptophan, a, a food supplement, cheaper. So they genetically engineered bacteria in fermentation vats starting, I think, in 1984 in Japan and started selling it to unsuspecting U.S. consumers. And then every few years or so, they would add more genes into the bacteria to make it even more effective at producing things so you wouldn't have to mix things into it afterwards because the bacteria will create it itself. They were not aware that this L-tryptophan had some contaminants, almost certainly as a result of the process of genetic engineering. Four, five, or six contaminants from 0.1% to 0.01%. The L-tryptophan still passed the U.S. pharmaceutical standard for purity. It was 98.5% pure and it started to kill people. It killed about 100 Americans and caused five to 10,000 to fall sick. Horrible disease, horrible disease. Eosinophilia myalgia syndrome. It was unique, it was severe, and it came on quickly. They found it and were able to take the tryptophan off the market. The FDA never acknowledged that it was only the genetically engineered version. They took all tryptophan off the market, which allowed for more Prozac sales, and claimed that it was the L-tryptophan doing it, even though it was only one company's version. And the other, company, other company's versions never created the same disease. And when they testified before Congress, they hid that evidence. They never mentioned genetic engineering. But somehow the process of genetic engineering created these side effects. Now there's many ways that it can occur. The tryptophan was toxic to the bacteria that was creating it. So the bacteria might have adjusted and created something. When you overproduce one thing, you might underproduce something else. There's all sorts of things that can go wrong. And now we're genetically engineering other things using little microorganisms as factories. In 1980, 1995, they genetically engineered yeast and added just more of yeast's own genes in it and ended up creating 40 to 200 fold increase in a carcinogen or a potential carcinogen. And they warned, be careful about genetically engineering yeast because it might create toxins. Now a company called Impossible Burger is using yeast and put in a gene from soybean roots to create something that looks like blood, leg hemoglobin. Never been part of the human food supply. Created from genetically engineered yeast. What could go wrong? And while they created that, guess what? In the soupy fermented mixture that they just stuff into the burger, there's 46 other, gene, other proteins that have never been part of the human food, food supply and never been characterized for safety. So about almost 30% of the stuff that they put in is these sludge that's not the leg hemoglobin. And in the leg hemoglobin protein itself is uncharacterized, unknown for its safety impacts. Add that with some Roundup Ready soy, which is sprayed with Roundup, and there's your Impossible Burger designed to save the planet. Friends don't let friends eat the Impossible Burger, right? Yeah. 
now that you hear that. There is a group that's now collecting information from people who got sick after eating the Impossible Burger. And I'm looking forward to publicizing their results. But this is just one use of what we call synthetic biology. There's groups like this lab of Evolva in Switzerland. There's all sorts of things. There's vanilla, there's sandalwood, stevia, saffron, opioids, caffeine. I mean, all these things are being created. The taste of it or the replacements for it, some of the vanilla on the market right now is from genetically engineered micro factories. And of course, not only does that create a potential side effect, but what does it do to the people who've created the infrastructure of harvesting the vanilla over decades and centuries. It might be plowed over and they might place genetically engineered soy there instead. So we can be displacing cultures and when we understand the role of the so-called active ingredient versus the whole, uh, the whole ecosystem within an herb or a plant, we realize this whole concept of an active ingredient is a fraud. But if they just produce the active ingredient and don't, incre and don't allow all those other aspects or those compounds to work together, it may never get the healing properties that we haven't yet even discovered. So before we discovered the fact that broccoli sprouts have all these incredible things, it's possible they could have changed it so it never actually produced those and we would never know. And they want to genetically engineer the active ingredient of Ayurvedic herbs. You can go to SynBioWatch to get an ingredient database as to what they're creating, SynBioWatch. Now here's another fun one. Double-stranded RNA already being deployed in apples and potatoes near you. These apples and potatoes form a very important task. They don't turn brown when you slice them. So they lie about their age, like the Botox apple. You can cut it, it can shrivel, but it'll never turn brown. Now, what they do is they put in a gene that produces a little piece of RNA that folds back on itself and becomes double-stranded. It's very short, maybe 22 nucleotides, and its code will then, as if, hunt for a matching code in the DNA of the apple. And when it finds it, it silences the expression of that particular gene. So it's gene silencing technology. It's one of the things that RNA does. Surprise, no one knew 30 years ago. Now, could that be impactful on humans? Well, we know that when they fed honeybees one meal of double-stranded RNA, they chose the double-stranded RNA from something that was completely foreign to the honeybee, so they wanted it to use it as a control. They were looking for something that had no impact whatsoever. And they checked the gene expression twice, a few weeks later and a few weeks later. And they found that over 1,400 genes had changed their levels of expression. About 10% of the genome of the honeybee was altered in its functioning because of a single meal of double-stranded RNA. They know that it, humans can eat double-stranded RNA and it can affect and change our gene expression. RNA is one of the ways that we get intelligence from our food. It's not just minerals and proteins and phytochemicals. The RNA can help tell our DNA how to express. They've changed uh, gene expression in mice through double-stranded RNA. So if you eat the apple or the potato, what will happen when that double-stranded RNA finds a match in your genome? It might reprogram it. And this was the warning of a USDA scientist who published an article, much to the chagrin of his, of his superiors, and he's no longer at the USDA. I interviewed him. And his point was, we have no way to evaluate the risks. Because all these different organisms out in the nature, including humans, 
could eat the apple. He wasn't talking specifically about the apple, but eat anything that's using the double-stranded RNA, and it can change their gene expression. The EPA scientists came out with a similar article, not on GMO organisms that use RNA, but on sprays. Monsanto got approved a spray that kills bugs by changing their gene expression. And imagine if the wind blows and it lands on you. What happens with this mysterious rash? Who knew? And they have used an interesting double standard saying, oh, it couldn't possibly affect us. It doesn't affect through different species. And yet somehow we use it as an insecticide so it actually kills different species. So it works where we want it to and it doesn't work where we don't want it to. That's their, their theory. Oops. Now, changes in RNA turn out to be inheritable as well. Epigenetics. It's not just the genes that are passed down, but also the mechanism that tells which genes to express. And this has unfortunately been discovered by a scientist that injected Roundup into mice. And 90% of the great-grandchildren had serious diseases. And they was more serious than the grandchildren. The children were fine, and the injected pregnant mouse was fine, and mice. But the great-grandchildren had it worse. 90% had prostate, kidney, prostate and kidney disease, obesity, and deaths during pregnancy. If you want to know more details, Please like our Facebook, Institute for Responsible Technology, and go da back to an interview I did with Dr. Skinner. I speak with him for 45 minutes. He is the scientist that did this research. And it's astounding. He thinks we're already suffering from the DDT exposure of our parents. And the obesity, he thinks, is in part due to the results of this epigenetic effect of previous chemicals. Now, instead of looking at GMOs, we're looking at GMEs, genetically modified ecosystems, where you can genetically engineer the bacteria in your soil, the insects that will pollinate, the sprays that will create changes in the plants. You may even use non-GMO plants and call them non-GMO, but everything else in the environment around it has been genetically engineered. Now, what's interesting is, and there's so many different ways the genetic engineer, this is a list I'm not even going to start, but the one common result, the most common result of genetic engineering is surprise side effects. And there's a statement made by a scientist in England that I like to quote, or at least paraphrase, and that a risk, no matter how small, if repeated, uh, is, is repeated enough, becomes a certainty. When you have problems that are one in a thousand, one in 10,000, one in a million, what happens if we introduce a million genetically engineered organisms in this generation? What we could alter the weather, we could create, we can damage terrestrial plants, create sterility, wipe out species, and, there, and we know the impacts of a single, a single natural invasive species that worked in harmony with its own ecosystem, transplanted to New York City or Long Island or, or Washington or wherever, it can create chaos in the ecosystem. And they're talking about replacing the ecosystem with a technology whose number one most common result is surprise side effects. What could go wrong? Everything. Now, we have arrived at an inevitable time in human civilization. This is part of the deal. This is part of science. We've got to the place where we can reorder the codes of life cheaply and easily. We can redirect the streams of evolution. And we have not gotten to the point where we understand the impacts, where we have long-term thinking in our individuals and our government and our corporations. And we don't have that supremely high ethics and morality 
to carry that responsibility. So we now have a new responsibility that comes with this new capacity. And this is what my organization, the Institute for Responsible Technology, is now focusing on. I'm not giving up on talking about the health dangers and changing people's lives. I'm going to give you a shortcut in five minutes. Maybe some of you will change, their, change your number in orga to organic. Let's just play with that. And then we'll come back to the bigger picture. Changes in Roundup Ready Corn, for example. Higher levels of putrescine and cadaverine, this, the, the, responsible for the foul odor of rotting dead bodies. They're also linked to cancer and allergies. We have the stomach lining of rats and that have changed as a result of the process of genetic engineering, irrespective of what gene you put in. People who switch to non-GMO and largely organic diet reported getting better from 28 different conditions. 85% said digestive problems. Let me just read a few. Fatigue, obesity, brain fog, depression, anxiety, allergies and sensitivities, memory and concentration. Did I say memory and concentration? Joint pain, seasonal allergies, gluten sensitivity, insomnia, skin conditions, hormonal problems, musculoskeletal pain, autoimmune disease, eczema, high blood pressure, asthma, menstrual problems, diabetes, etc., cancer, autism, people reporting getting better from those things. And we also have a situation where animals, pets and livestock taken off of GMOs get better from some of those things as well. And lab animals force-fed GMOs in Roundup suffer from those things or their precursors. And the rates of disease for those and similar things are rising in the US population in parallel with GMOs. Let's look at just the just the slope of the line, which is, in this case, the amount of Roundup sprayed on Roundup-ready soy and corn in the United States compared to inflammatory bowel disease. Notice the similarity. This is correlation. It doesn't prove causation. But when you have all these other things, including we understand how Roundup and GMOs could create every one of the diseases I'm about to show, so we have the plausible causative pathways that could explain why consumption of more GMOs than your body weight per year, and all the Roundup, not only in GMOs, but in the grains and beans that are sprayed with Roundup before harvest, why it could be creating and promoting these diseases, we know how. So let's just look at these diseases and see if you happen to fit in the category or someone you know, inflammatory bowel disease in deaths from intestinal infection, peritonitis, uh, death from kidney failure, acute kidney injury, hepatitis C, autism at six years old, nearly a perfect correlation, diabetes, deaths from stroke, Deaths from uh, our dementia. Deaths from senile dementia. Alzheimer deaths. Parkinson deaths. Deaths from obesity. Deaths from hypertension. Anemia. Insomnia. Other sleep disorders. Celiac birth defects, lipoprotein metabolism deaths, anxiety, suicide by overdose, schizophrenia, ADHD, breast cancer. New research shows that glyphosate did promote breast cancer when it was present with another compound that's present in all humans causing multiplication of breast cancer tumors in mice. The, I, the International Agency for Research on Cancer said glyphosate's a probable human carcinogen, which might explain the correlation with liver and bile duct cancer, kidney and pelvic cancer, urinary bladder cancer, thyroid cancer, acute myeloid leukemia deaths, and glyphosate and Roundup are sprayed on the non-GMO grains and beans and also lots of fruits and vegetables. So that's why we say organic. Organic to avoid GMOs and Roundup. Non-GMO could still be sprayed with Roundup. 
If you want to know what can happen if you switch to organic, I did a film with Amy Hart. It took us four years. It converts virtually everyone who sees it to raise their number to a higher percentage of what they're committing to in their life in terms of organic. Because two autistic kids in the film, their family switches to organic, they're no longer on the spectrum. 92 couples who were infertile, they switched to an organic diet and, a, and as part of a chiropractic care, all of them have children. People who had cancer, skin problems, brain fog, overweight, they switch, they get better, the doctors verify, the science explains why. Secretingredientsmovie.com. Please take a picture of this slide. Please go there and show it to the people you've been trying to convince to change their diet and watch it yourself so that you can increase your number. For those here today, I have copies of this and my earlier film, Genetic Roulette, outside. They'll be on sale right after. An interesting motivation for people is that many types of animals, when given a choice, will eat the, the non-GMO, but not the GMO. Mice, rats, cows, deer, elk, raccoons, birds, dogs, chickens. We have to get humans up to the level of animals. And let's see how we did. Rate yourself what percentage of your diet will be organic going forward. So how many people plan to be zero to 20 going forward? Raise your hand. Zero to 20, hardly any, that means, that means very low percentage of organic. Zero to 20. Okay, low percentage. Now people understand what I'm saying, and now the hands go down. <laughs> okay, 20 to 40, let's see. How many people plan to be 20 to 40% organic? How many people plan to be 40 to 60% organic? 60 to 80% organic? and 80 to 100% organic, and you 80 to 40, 80 to 100% has it. As the, as, so we did see a shift here. So I did it in six minutes this time. I usually spend an hour. It's much more effective if I spend an hour, but just watch the film. I don't have to talk about it anymore because the film does it. Because I've done the film, I can talk about the bigger existential threat, which I started to, and which I'll now come back to. So now, comparing GMOs to climate change, how many people think that GMOs are nowhere near or not as threatening as climate change. Raise your hand. Not a dry eye in the house, not a hand up. How many people think it's about the same? Raise your hand. Okay, we got a few, we got a couple, three. And, uh, and more dangerous, raise your hand. And that's everyone else. Okay, so you can see, I do this to see if the lecture has made a change in your perception and also your plans going forward. Many of you now are planning to eat more organic and that's great. But what else can we do about this? We can go to protectnaturenow.com, and you could take a picture of this to get the, the URL. And there's a little social media opportunity for you to share a picture of something or someone you want to protect. And what you're doing is you're sharing the website, protectnaturenow.com, which has the three-minute video, which you saw earlier. Although it's a feminine, British feminine voice, I ended up using an older one for this one. But that is a good introduction. A lot of people will watch a three-minute film. Especially if you post it and you know them. So, and you can share something that you want to protect. And if you go to the bottom of that page, you can link to other resources and see interviews with scientists talking about many things we've already discussed here today. Now, that does not have the name of my institute. It does not have an opportunity to donate. That is an unbranded site so that we can ask all the nonprofits to use it and send people. We are not in competition. We are into collaboration. In fact, if a nonprofit wants it, we will give them the three-minute video. They can put their own call to action at the end, go to oursite.com, and we'll give them all the research and all the links that we put on our site because we want this to be, the, the, we want the bell to ring around the world. We want everyone to know about this existential threat. So the whole climate change community, just change the name to Planetary Survival. And now you have another talking point. Oceans, another talking point. Animal rights, add another talking point. Gardeners, birders, mothers, indigenous people, religions, protecting nature. So GMO doesn't, you know, means God move over. Let's protect nature. We can get this talking point, get this information out around the world. And that's our goal. So we don't, we don't have time to grow a movement from scratch. We can't take the fledgling number of anti-GMO activists in the world and put the burden on them. Let's take it as an opportunity 
for people to protect all living beings and all future generations. So I'm going to give you some things you can do. You can, call, you can text this number to join our list. So you can take a picture of that and text afterwards or go to Protect Nature Now and, and put in your email address so you can take pictures of this now. And I'm going to give you a couple other things you can do because we're wrapping up and now, is, now you're going to take all this energy to do something. Otherwise, uh, otherwise I've totally failed. If you go to non-gmoimproveshealth.com, I've got a gift for you. A book, free, delivered as a PDF, my second book, called Genetic Roulette. And you, you will see it after you see the summary and the actual survey results of 3,256 people who switched to non-GMO and largely organic food. What did they get better from and why? There's also an interview with Dr. Michelle Perro, the pediatrician, and an update of research that's occurred since the book Genetic Roulette was published, all free at non-gmoimproveshealth.com. If you go to livehealthybewell.com, I have a podcast. You can sign up there or wherever you get your podcasts. And we have links to Secret Ingredients, the movie. We have links to a 90-day lifestyle upgrade to help you adopt an organic lifestyle, which has cooking lessons and how to sprout and how to ferment and more information about the dangers and information about the existential threat. And you'll meet people that have created amazing products at the end of the 90 days. It's like, oh, my whole life is better. How did that happen? And we have, for those that have the question, which is the second most popular question I've been asked in quarter of a century, in addition to changing our diet, is there anything else that I can do? And I'd always say, it's above my pay grade. But I found 18 experts where it was not above their pay grade. I asked them the questions. They answer your questions. What else can you do? Well, there's detoxing, rebuilding, repairing, and here are supplements, and here are procedures, and here's a diet. So that's available online as well. If you want to know more about these incredible Monsanto trials, we have an interview with Brent Wisner that is better than a courtroom drama movie. His stories are amazing. So catch Brent Wisner's interviews at responsibletechnology.org. And while you're there, please donate. You know, the, we have been massively successful at IRT. When I started, no other group was focusing on the health dangers of GMOs. They're focused on the ecological problems or the farmers' issues or the patenting of life. And I was thinking, that's not the weakness of Monsanto. And that's not our strength. Our strength is in consumer purchasing power. They own governments. They have their own judges and lawyers. They own many levels of the policymakers and the media. Let's, change, let's, let's inform people, change their diet, and drive GMOs out of the US food supply like it was driven out of Europe. Same principle, it's working. Yes, thank you. However, to protect nature now from GM bacteria and fish and mosquitoes and grass and trees, your choices in the supermarket are not going to be enough. We need to alert all of the children in the schools with proper curriculum, all the universities so that their institutional review boards don't approve releases, the scientific communities, the political structure, the international treaties. We need to alert the media, the religious people, all these different groups so that everyone realizes we have arrived at this inevitable time in human civilization. It's here. It's not coming. It's here. When you can buy a do-it-yourself CRISPR kit on Amazon for $159, it's here. And we now need to put in place the protective mechanisms. Not to demonize scientists for doing what they've always been doing, tinkering, playing, trying, 
protecting all living beings, being tapped awake at night by your great-great-grandchildren, by being tapped awake at night by the whales and the mosquitoes and the gut bacteria and the grasshoppers, waiting for us to step up. This is not something that we have to take as a heavy burden. We can take this as an opportunity to do more good than any former member of the human race could ever have done. Protecting all living beings for all future generations. This is an opportunity that is worth our energy, that is worth our money, that is worth our attention. And we get to stand and celebrate the outcome as we pass on the earth to future generations. And they will thank us because we've stepped up and done what's needed. Thank you.